Ben is amazing. His only opponent is from within. What can I say? We had so much fun recording this little mini tune, and now I thought I'd show you once again, try to explain you know, what goes on in my head when trying to write music. Uh, this time around, we're going to be looking at more of a, you know, kind of slow melodic playing. And usually what I do when trying to write a melody is to sit down with a chord progression on the backing track, and just without playing, trying to, you know, in my head, hear, hear a melody. And uh, usually I'll have no problems you know, trying to imagine a cool melody. Uh, but when it comes to actually you know, playing it on the guitar, that's when I get problems. Uh, and so what I do is I, I try to find the key of the song. In this case, we're in A minor. And then I'll try to find a compromise between you know, what my fingers can do and what I heard in my head. Now in the beginning, this was pretty frustrating to me because you know I, w I wanted to be able to play exactly what I heard in my head. Uh, but then I you know realized that you know, within that limitation or that compromise, that's actually where the magic can occur. Right? At least that's the case for me. So maybe maybe this can be helpful for you as well. So what I do is try to hear it in my head, and then I just find the key, and then I you know has I have. The, the, the original thought as a guideline, but I let my you know fingers try to do the rest of the job. The first part I played was over the, the so-called chorus, and uh, that was a little softer playing, you know, like. And then from there, I went to the verse, and I wanted to sort of different, differentiate those two parts. So I, I figured I would go higher up on the guitar and play higher notes, and maybe add a little more aggressive uh, vibrato to it. Uh, so I wanted to do something like this. But then my fingers hurt so much, <laughs> so because I've been practicing and playing a lot that, that day. Uh, so I couldn't really do that kind of thing. Um, so you know, th that was my limitation at the time of recording this. So I thought, you know, what am I going to do? Um, and then, uh, you know, it struck me like I could as well apply some vibrato with a whammy bar. So instead of playing this from the where are we, 16th fret E string, I played and added vibrato with the whammy bar. I also added this kind of... And all of a sudden I had a phrase which now to me sounds more fresh than doing standard kind of... Another kind of limitation which you may encounter if you haven't already is trying to play faster and more technical stuff. Um, and I often hear advanced stuff in my head and then I have problems playing it on the guitar. And now here's a little mini trick which could, uh, could help you if, wanted, if you want to do you know, fast picking runs but you, you don't really have the technique yet for that. Um, when I use fast picking, I prefer to do it as some kind of build up to a melody or a strong note. You've probably heard me speak about that before. So, a lot of times I'll do some kind of three note per string thing and land on a strong note. Like... Or I'll even do some kind of uh, nonsense chromatic stuff. Uh, like... Or... Uh... Yeah, you know, imagination always plays tricks with me. <laughs> like... 
Uh, I find that a lot of time playing notes that are out, which are just chromatic or nonsense, uh, creates a really cool contrast if you know where you're landing. So I'll do that a lot of times. But then it struck me that, hey, if I'm just to play random notes, why do I have to play like a tricky picking thing involving, you know, going from one string to another, when I could just do something with treble picking on one single string, like this. So that doesn't look like much, uh, but when recording it, it sounds just as cool as if you were to do some kind of... Or what not. So... Well, thank you for that, Chris. That kicked ass, as always. Um, well, what can I say, people? I don't know how Chris got that tone. My only guess is he sold his soul to the devil. Right, um, I guess I'll explain a little bit about my thinking behind approaching the solo to this song. Funny enough, after watching Chris's explanation, I would say that um, I actually approach it very similar. I listen to uh, the backing or the song that I'm going to play over, and I actually just start imagining melodies and parts of solos automatically. I don't necessarily sit down and think, what am I going to do over that? It just sort of, I just sort of start imagining things, you know, licks that I know I can play or licks that are maybe typical of my playing style. And I sort of sit down and develop it from there, really. One thing I did feel quite strongly about, actually, was um, truly following my own sort of feelings about what I should play rather than try and coerce something that I wasn't, you know. I did actually have a previous solo and I had some flashy bits in it and I thought, well, really, they don't really add anything. I'm doing it for the sake of it, you know, so I removed them and totally just sort of sat down, listened to the track and let it inspire stuff to come out, what was meant to come out, and therefore there was nothing there that shouldn't be there and everything that was there was meant to be there, you know, delete needless notes, basically, you know. If you're putting too many notes in, you know, is, do they really need to be there? You know, in that philosophy, I think it was really refreshing to actually do that in this song. You know, it's one of the first songs I've done for ages. It was truly just, you know, economy rather, you know, quality rather than quantity, or at least, you know, I hope so anyway. There's a couple of licks I'd like to talk about, which I find uh, sort of interesting personally. You may not. You may think they're crap, and if you think they're crap, you know, that's totally your opinion, and feel free to keep your opinion to yourself. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so yeah, this first lick is pretty simple. This one. And uh, the reason I like this one is this note at the end, the A note, it just sort of hangs on. And the chord underneath it goes to is an F, or an F major in particular. And that A note becomes the third of F. So it really melodically works, you know, even though it's so simple, you know, going... It's going from... That's what gives it that nice sort of sound. If you pick like sort of strong notes like thirds and fifths over the backing chords, you know, it really sort of... It's notes like that which mean you just don't need to go for flashy licks, you know. If you pick a strong note, you know, it says more than, you know, ten notes or one thousand notes, you know. And the other thing I'd like to mention about this is uh, the way I bend that note is I sort of have a sort of Marty Friedman, uh, Michael Schenker approach in that, you know, I almost sort of like stop notes and then bend them. Instead of going... You don't hear the bend, it's... I stop the note and then I pre-bend it and then hit it. And I think I've just got that from listening to people like Schenker and Friedman. And I've also noticed like, people like Brian May do it as well, you know, Uli John Roth. And I think, you know, people like Mike Friedman were inspired by Schenker and Roth and Brian May. And so it came from somewhere from those guys in the 70s. But it's really cool and I just sort of picked that up. And I like it because it sort of has a, a sort of commanding approach. It feels like you're in control rather than the guitar being in control of you. And um, yeah, I like that. So yeah, that lick all the way through is... The other lick that I uh, like is the one which I begin my second solo with. After Chris has played his last solo, 
I come in with this lick that's like this. And you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, it's a very Vi lick. And it is. It is a Steve Vi type lick, you know, and I won't pretend that it isn't. You know, I love those sort of things he does. He sort of crosses the neck in sort of fifths, and uh, we're starting on the note of C. Because the chord underneath is a C. I think it's a C add 9 or a C major. I'm not sure if Chris used a C add 9 or a C major there. But, um... In the notes I use, I could do a C to a G, and that is basically the root note C, and the fifth of C, and then I move up, start again on the fifth, and end on a note which ends up becoming the ninth of C. So we've gone root fifth, fifth ninth, and we go from the ninth to a major sixth, which is a, if you play C major, it's the sixth note, which is that, which is an A. So we go root, fifth, fifth, ninth, ninth, sixth. Then I change tack there and I go back to fifth and then root again. Yeah, so the beauty with these licks is they probably sound more complicated than they actually are. They sound flashier than they are and I like licks like that. You know, all it is is you just go... Except, you know, the, the greater result sounds much better than what you're actually putting in. You know, I love licks like that and you can choose intervals within that chord you can go outside of the chord you know it's totally up to you what licks you use but yeah and the note i end up on is a g which is the third of what chord are we in yeah so we're in c major there so that ends up being a fifth okay so we're starting on c we go up through these intervals and we go to the fifth and that's a really strong note because you know it forms the basis of a chord, a fifth, usually. And that note is the G. There. And then we go from that to these weird sort of, this weird thing. And I like that because it's sort of like repetitive. It's like having a strong motif that repeats is, you know, a key to, you know, a good memorable solo. You know, it's like a vocal melody, really. You know, I'll do this sort of classical vibrato, you know. You know, which is quite tricky to start with if you've never done it before, but you know, it's definitely worth learning because when you get to higher strings, it can be a little bit hard to put on wide vibrato if you're just used to regular up and down, stuff like that. It can be, e um, not easy, but it can be harder to put uh, a lot of expression into the notes on higher strings, but if you use classical vibrato, it gives you a lot of scope to... really get behind the notes and you know put loads of juice into them as it were and it goes so basically it goes from so after this piece we bend up to an E which by then the chord progression has come back around to the C, the C major, in that E note becomes a third, and that's what gives it that really nice strong sound. You know, if you pick notes which are basically building blocks to a chord, you can never sort of really go wrong, you know, have roots, thirds, fifths, sevenths, stuff like that, really good. You know, it's, you don't have to have like massive theoretical chord knowledge, just a little bit enables you to identify what relationship that note has to a chord, you know, you can tell whether it's second, third, fourth, fifth, blah, 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 you know, and uh, that's what sort of helps you create really good melodies. So hopefully, you know, what me and Chris have said have you know, made sense somewhat, and, um, but yeah, have a go over the backing track and sort of see what you come up with, you know, nick some of our licks, you know, you'll probably come up with something better than me and Chris anyway. So now the time has come for your limitations to meet your imagination. So you're going to do that over the backing track we just used uh, and um, to help you out we're going to show you the, the chords and the strong solo notes as the, the backing progresses. And you could use 
For instance, the little shred mini cheating trick and have that as a build up and then land on the strong notes. That's just one suggestion, but I'm sure your imagination and limitations will result in more adventurous playing than that. So uh, good luck and thanks for watching us and uh, listening to us and uh, see you soon. Cheers.